I started the journey for nothing more than the fact that I thought maybe I needed to give it, you know, a real try. I needed to try to go on tour and see if I could do it without a single drink in the course of a year. And your book came, uh, there's so many books, there's, there's loads of books, how to stop drinking and how to do this and how to do that. And I, and I found a lot of them very, I don't want to say dull, but it just was really hard to wrap my head around the process. And your process made it so easy because of what you created here and how you wrote the book and how you sort of made it flow. It helped me go along my journey because you put your day numbers in. <laughs> day 40, day this and day that. And I, I would coincide. So take me to this spot because for our listeners that are just learning about you, it started with this amazing blog and here we are. You've got this amazing book. Yeah, I mean, my, my story is, is, you know, very similar to a lot of people who, who find that they end up in having a problem with alcohol and that it just sort of crept up on me. You know, I, I used to drink a glass of wine at the end of the day to relax and, you know, it's like me time and it was my way of chilling out and, um, you know, and that glass of wine turned into two glasses of wine, which turned into three glasses of wine. And before long, I was drinking a bottle a day and more at weekends. So I was drinking about 10 bottles of wine a week, uh, which is way too much, obviously. And it started to have a really bad impact on my life. And, you know, at, I think at that point, I felt really lonely because I thought I didn't know anybody else like me. I, you know, the image I had of people who had alcohol problems was very different from the image I had of myself. And, you know, I, I felt like I was the only person who couldn't cope with alcohol in the way that, you know, in the way that normal people could. Um, and, and I was made to feel like I wasn't normal. And, uh, and as a result, I started, um, I started writing a blog and I started writing it to sort of get my head around what I was going through. And I called the blog, Mummy Was a Secret Drinker. Um, and I started it the day I stopped drinking and it was my therapy. So I wrote every single day and I wrote what was going on in my life. And I never publicized it, but more and more people found it. And, you know, within a year, actually, I'd had nearly a million hits on the blog uh, without any publicity. And what I discovered is, is that, you know, we're all very different. We come from different places. We are different ages. We, you know, we have different backgrounds. And yet people, when they quit drinking, go through such a similar experience and, um, you know, and so when I started sharing my story, I had people all over the world saying, God, I feel exactly the same and just the same thing happened to me. And, you know, and we, as a result, all of us felt much less alone. And I guess that's why I published the book, because I didn't want anyone else to feel like I did when I first quit drinking. I didn't want anyone else to feel that lonely. I didn't want anyone else to feel that different or that abnormal um you know i wanted them to realize that you know there are millions of us out there that can't cope with alcohol because alcohol is a toxin it's an addictive drug and you know if you get in trouble with it it's not your fault it's the fault of the drug um and that's that's what i wanted people to understand but i mean i guess the other thing i really wanted to do is is to make it upbeat and to make it fun because you know, I mean, everything I'd read about alcohol was all doom and gloom. It was like, this is going to be so hard and so miserable. <laughs> and sometimes it is hard, but, you know, the best way of getting through it is to make it not miserable, you know, is to, you know, it's actually the most transformative thing you can do with your life is to quit drinking. It's a really positive and a phenomenal thing to do. So I wanted a book that was upbeat and was was funny and well know. it certainly is and it made me laugh and especially as you adjusted to going to dinner parties <laughs> and things because one of the one of the things you touch on is how you're more likely to be given a glass of wine at a, at a play date mm. right than than juice or water or something because it's just the most common thing and uh, the biggest thing that i found through this journey especially being on tour the the, the, the first thing people say to you is what what are you talking about? And I'm, uh, why? Or, or uh, did you have a problem or did you have this? And 
my I guess, did I have a problem? I'm not sure I can answer that. Did I foresee a problem? Potentially. Did I drink a lot the year before? 100%. So while I'm going through trying to be as responsible as possible and be a good dad and, and a husband and all the rest of it, this, this kind of creeps in and becomes a bit of a normal end of the day, mm. get on the bus, have a couple of doubles, have a, have a whatever, go to sleep. And people can't wrap their head around when you want to stop doing that. And you make it fun in the book how you counter it. <laughs> it's funny, you, isn't it? Because, you, know, um, you know, you give up smoking and everyone treats you like a hero, you know, and you give up alcohol and people think you're a bit crazy. And, you know, I mean, uh, something I, I talk about in the book is, is, you know, alcohol is the only drug that you have to justify not taking. And, you know, it's crazy because... You know, any other, you know, you, you can give up gluten or dairy and people go, oh, that's cool. <laughs> you know, but you give up alcohol and they go, why? Um, and I think it's, it's because it's because it makes people question their own behavior and nobody likes having to do that. It does that. I'm finding a bit of that. People, oh, I could never do that. Or, I, or, mm. or how do you do it? Or or just the 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 journey of day one because they're sober October and there's January now people aren't drinking okay I'm drinking you know people plan it out they plan out their I'm gonna go well I can't stop drinking on the 20th of December because we've got Trevor and Marie's party on the 21st oh and then we've got to go yeah I did uh, that stuff for years right then we've got to go <laughs> to like Oh, and then the, my husband's family's having dinner, and that's always good for four bottles. Like, like we 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 plan. It. I've seen. I was part of it. It's like, well, people literally. I've, I feel like sober October or or January. It's it's been created, and now people go, well, okay, well, I got to get all my drinking in, in September, because then I'm going to be sober in October. But there's these little things, and that day one hurdle is seems to be easy because. A lot of people, after they've been drunk for two or three days, don't want to drink on for a couple of days. So then you, you okay, it's a week, and then it's then it's two weeks. I started with three months, and then I'm like, well, I'm at 90 days, so 100's right there. Oh, there's 125. Well, 150 is just around the corner. So just it kind of go, went like that. And reading along your your book as you were kind of describing what you were going through on this day and that day and. All yeah, the rest see, of it. This, I think, is, is part of the problem with a, a sort of dry January and sober October because the first month is the hardest, um, but it's also the one where you get the fewest results because actually you find that it's about 100 days when the really good things start kicking in, and that's also when it gets easier. So if you've quit drinking just for a month, you've gone through the hardest bit without getting any of the really good bits. So, you know, you're bound to think, oh, that's a bit miserable. I better start drinking again. Actually, what you really want to do is give it 100 days and then see how you feel. And that's where it was. It was 100 days for me, and I was like, well, I feel really great. The detachment of a good time. This, for me is the thing that I think people struggle the most with because as long as we've been kids, our parents had, you know, we were going out, wherever we were going out, parents were like, oh, got to stop at the, got to get some wine or mm. we got to do, and for me, I can think back to like every single thing from as long as I can remember was attached to alcohol. It was attached to like, I'm just saying Christmas parties, the, the, the neighbors building a shed and they're all drinking beer, ice yes, it's totally whatever it's going to be. It's hardwired into our it's self-conscious. Hard, it's hardwired into our into our system that we that you know that it's that you need it for a good time, and that is the hardest thing to break, especially on tour, because when you're on tour with people, half the time this is how you're getting to know people. Mm. You know, you can come into the first show and not meet anybody until you get on the bus after that first show and everyone's like, okay, what's your name? How are you? What's your job? Cool. What are you drinking? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sparkling. I'll take a Pellegrino and lime. Okay. And then day two, it's like, I'll take two Pellegrinos and lime. And then <laughs> you start getting the separation of like what the bus starts separating into the people who drink and the people who don't. And that's like life as well. I've got people that I've told about it and it makes people it can make people a bit uncomfortable it, it can and you know it's a shame because you know I think you know I I have some friends who were you know I 
our friendship was based on on drink, you know, doing a lot of drinking together, and and those friendships have been difficult since I quit. But um, I found that the friends I do have um, are, um, you know, my friendships are much deeper because actually, you know, drinking makes you quite or it certainly did with me, it made me quite selfish. You know, I was always on transmit, you know, I was always sort of, I was, I'd was i yabber away and I wouldn't really listen to anything anybody said. And then if they did say interesting stuff, I couldn't remember it the next day anyway. And <laughs> and I'm not sure that, you know, I, I never really paid attention. And now I don't drink. I listen properly. I have really proper deep conversations with people I remember them the next day I remember the important stuff I'm really so you know I'm a much better friend so you know and and actually I've made friends with a much wider group of people than I was ever friends with before because I used to pick my friends partly just on on their stamina and how you know whether they were as big a drinker as I was whereas now I pick friends for all sorts of reasons and my friends are much more wide-ranging and eclectic and and interesting and there's the one thing that is going on in the world right now is that, I mean, everyone's got a voice mm. or everyone's got something to talk about or everyone's got, like, it's not as, like, it's easy to find people that don't drink. Uh, it's easy to find sober people everywhere. On tour, I'm finding it's starting to become a lot easier. People are uh, traveling. A lot of bands are better at it now. A lot of more bands are sober now, mm. which is filtering down to the crew. And so things are changing a little bit on that side of it. So I am finding it a little bit easier. Thanks for stopping by, friends, to the Brenton on Tour podcast channel on YouTube. Coffee, music, travel, life, all of those things. One page, lots of guests, lots of chatter. We talk about all of it. If you like it, subscribe. Hit the thumbs up button. Leave a comment. I'll get back to you. Thanks, friends. See you next time.